Hello everybody, uh, thanks for coming. This is, um, the talk is quit logging or data minimization in Debian. Um, so I'm Daniel Khan gilmore DKG, um, and this is Matt Taggart. And um, so we're gonna talk about some issues around, uh, around privacy and security and the intersection between privacy and um, and a bunch of other stuff in Debian, um, with a focus on logs. So just so just so you know, like where I'm coming from on this, um, I work for the American Civil Liberties Union right now. I'm a technologist in their speech privacy and technology project, and we are concerned about um, about the amount of data that uh, can be used against people um, in the world right now, and so. I'm coming at it from a perspective of someone who's very much interested in civil liberties and what we can do for that. And uh, I'm part of uh, Rise Up Networks and we host uh, email and other online services for activists, many of whom are in very repressive re regimes and, uh, and are, are trying to do things anonymously and if they're outed, uh, literally their lives are at risk and so uh, we have to take some of these things very seriously so that's kind of the pr perspective I'm coming from. So. Um, and hopefully this is a discussion. People have questions, please raise your hands. Um, we're gonna raise a couple of different ideas that, uh, that we have about things we can do to improve the situation, um, but we wanna hear what you all think is worth doing and as well, so. Um, so just for background to explain the intersection with civil liberties and, um, and logging, um, we're living in this time of a sort of data flood. Um, so there's more machine readable data than ever, um, and there's a much more centralized data storage um, that, that builds up. Um, so that stuff is available to all different kinds of people for all different kinds of purposes, but it's available to um, systems that do accounting, so like making sure that they know how, to, how much to charge you for data usage on your phone. Um, it's used by law enforcement to find out things about um, uh, uh, what you've been up to. Uh, one thing I didn't mention up here, it's also used for things like um, real world traffic analysis, like how busy is the road, how fast are the cars moving on the road. Um, there's all kinds of data that's being collected. It's also used by marketers, um, and some of the data that, that is generated um, regularly is also used by the users. But it's interesting to note that the folks who are the subject of the data are only one of a very large, wide group of folks who are using the data. So the data that we are producing as we operate in this very digital world um, is, is usable by lots of people besides who it's about. And I just want to remind folks that, you know, as Debian, uh, as always, our priorities are our users, and the priorities of the folks who do the accounting systems and law enforcement and marketers may actually be very different than the priorities of the people who the data is about. So. Um, there's tons of data, and we can't address all of it right now. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe collectively we can, but in this talk, um, I'm going to focus on just a subset of the data, which is the logs that are produced by network services. Um, so uh, there's lots of other things that produce things you might think of as logs, uh, like your bash history, <laughs> um, but we're not going to cover that in this talk, and we're just going to try to sort of focus on network services. So. It's, it's worth noting that there are good reasons that your network services produce logs. Um, so I, I don't know how many of you here are systems administrators in addition to being members of the Debian community. I see a few hands rising involuntarily, um, like probably most system administration duties. Um, but so, you know, it's useful for debugging, it's useful for having an audit trail. Um, I don't know how many people here develop uh, user-facing software, but certainly logs are useful in usability studies about how, how say, a website gets used. Um, it's useful for diagnostics, um, it's useful for analytics to know, like, who is visiting your website or things like that. There's a lot of other things that it's useful for. Um, and the data that's getting logged covers lots and lots of stuff, but in particular, there are some details that are more identifiable that produce these patterns of information that can be used about someone, but maybe won't be used by that person. Um, and so, IP addresses, um, log like who logged like logs of who logged into a machine. Um, there's mail headers that get logged. There's cryptographic parameters that get logged. There's a whole bunch of different stuff um, that creates sort of fingerprintable trails in these data sets. 
Um, and those fingerprintable trails show, um, they show user activity, right? They show, they show what the people who are using these services do. Um, and the user may have no idea that they show that. And in addition to showing like what someone did specifically, they also produce, because of the volume of them, you, it might, it, you might not care if someone knows that you visited a given website once. Um, but there's also usage patterns, which reveal something about the way that you live your life. Um, so time of day, like what, what time in the morning do you usually get up? Um, if, say, the first thing you do when you get up is you check your Twitter feed, um, then they probably have a log that shows that this particular user is accessing the data at this particular time. And then because there's these user patterns, there's also this question of divergence, right? So when did you, oh, you got up really late today. You know, what were you doing last night? Um, it's, possible, it's possible to wine and cheese party, perhaps? Right? It's possible that you can get information just from the patterns that doesn't have anything to do with the actual content of the network service that was being used. Um, and then it's also worth noting that even if some of the data is sort of innocuous on its own, it can be correlated with other data to build a much richer picture um, about what someone is doing and, and who they are. Yeah, in particular, uh, I think it's kind of become clear that it's almost impossible to anonymize data sets. Uh, you know, researchers will get some data and they'll say, oh, we anonymized it to put it out there for people to use. And, and uh, through statistical methods, it, uh, very often people are successful in de-anonymizing it or using multiple data sets and, and correlating those. Um, and so even, even when you try to anonymize things, it still can reveal quite a bit. So, so why does it matter that these pictures are formable from the logs that we're generating, right? Um, so the intelligence community wants to just gather as much data as it can. Um, law enforcement uh, will tend to give a subpoena to someone, to like a service operator, and say, we would like to see your logs. Um, we, have a, we believe that such and such is a problem, so let's see your logs you know, around this time. Um, when they do that, they get a huge chunk of logs if the person who has the logs has them all, they give them over. So there's this sort of a collateral damage situation where anybody else who happened to be using the service, all their information gets, gets revealed as well. Um, someone who's into compromising systems can get into a system and take the log data from the system and use it for their own, for their own means. Um, there's marketers and business types who want to use this log information which is sort of a, it's a slightly different scenario because those folks are actually often operating from within the service that's logging. So they're saying, like, someone who works for Comcast actually came up to me at Hope earlier this summer, the conference in New York, and said, oh yeah, I, I, uh, I work in the division that records every TV show you've ever watched if you use Comcast. And it, we know when you watched it, and we know how much of the show you watched, and if you put it on pause, we know how long you put it on pause for. And it's very useful for us to have all of this information going back indefinitely because it lets us provide you with better recommendations for new TV shows to watch. So they're in a sort of a different situation than like law enforcement that does a subpoena. And I said, to the, I said, well, do you think maybe you could just stop keeping some of those logs at some point? Have you guys considered like, an, you know, a policy on that? He's like, ah, uh, we could, but nobody's ever really brought it up before, and you know. In the future, we might want that stuff. Did you want it? I thought by law they have to delete it after one year. Repeat. So the, he said, I thought by law they have to delete it after one year. Uh, I don't know of the law that says they have. I don't know of any U.S. law that does that, but I'm not a lawyer. So if you can find me and point, if you can find that law and point me out to it, I would, I would be very happy to hear about it. Um, so. Um, so who might be the target of some of this data gathering? So um, a target in, in the sense of someone who's actually been, who can be directly harmed by it as opposed to just being, feeling a little bit creeped out and not quite sure why. There's activists and dissidents, which Matt mentioned. Um, if you use a web service and they have all this data about you and then the service gets compromised, that's information about you that, that is now not under your control. And in addition to that, they can use that to then, especially if it's tied to an email address and you know users are notoriously bad about using the same passwords everywhere, they compromise one service and they can go from there. And that's why it's such a big deal when, when uh, some of these big providers get hacked is that it, it spreads like wildfire. And then companies may also have uh, interest in um, 
in knowing, for example, the usage patterns of their competing of their rivals. So this is not just a oh, you know, we're sticking up for, you know, the the radical, you know, revolutionaries who are under a repressive regime. Like you have good reason to not want to keep a bunch of data around in the event that your own machines are, you know, that you lose control of them. Um, that data is now in the hands of whoever took control of that machine. So there's a few other reasons why you might not want to log too much. Um, so that, and there's performance reasons. Um, so I don't know how many of you as systems administrators have dealt with um, I.O. contention as a result of massive activity. Your log files get real big real fast. The disk fills up. Um, there's, um, and some, some kinds of network activity actually produce multiple logs scattered all over the disk. Um, and so we have this example here from from Taggart. Yeah, this is specifically a, a rise up example, and we had to uh, split up the I/O of a bunch of these things because on our our mailing list server, uh, I'll take you know every time a single mail comes in, it hits the postfix spool and the postfix logs and the simpa spool and the simpa logs and the uh, list archive, and it's got to read from the list archive in order to rebuild all the indices and write all those out. And when those were all on the same physical spinning hard, di hard drive, uh, it was a huge amount of contention and super slow. Um, and the only way we could fix it was to individually divide up all that I.O. And then uh, and then one of the other things we did is, is mentioned at the top there, but um, uh, slow down the rate at which the, the log files are flushed to disk helps too, but there's definitely performance implications. And then lastly, people have devices that, are, that don't have persistent storage now. And um, so those devices, uh, you want to be able to make sure that they operate well without having a log. Um, so let's bring it into Debian. So what can, we, what can Debian do about the situation? And what is our responsibility in the situation as, as a major distro? So I want to point out that there are a lot of players in this ecosystem. And they're not, um, and everybody has res different responsibilities. So um, there's the users, people who use the network services about whom some of this data could potentially reflect. Um, they're the folks who operate the services, and um, there's distributions who provide the software to the systems administrators, and then there's upstreams. And we at Debian, right, I mean, this is old hat to say, but right, our priorities are our users and free software, and I want to point out that the users and the systems administrators are both our users, and free software is upstreams. So we have responsibilities to all of the other players in this particular ecosystem. Um, and so a user might have some responsibility, but the systems administrator has a lot more power. We at Debian are not about to override the systems administrator's needs, because the systems administrators are also our priority. But we do have a priority to the end user as well to ensure that we can set some kind of reasonable norm about what kind of data should we be keeping. Um, and we need to also make sure that there's a norm about what, you know, if you're a systems administrator, how do you debug your system when something's going wrong? We need to make that easy, make that useful, while at the same time respecting the needs of the users to not have large amounts of data floating around about them. So um, just, just for a second, because I, I think it's worth thinking about this, um, and people don't often just make the simple realization. If someone is trying to get da data about somebody else from you, there are a lot of different ways you can resist them getting that data from you. But the simplest way to resist is to not have that data, right? <laughs> And it's like it's a super super sort of stupid thing to come to, but that is that is the easiest way to resist giving some giving data away about somebody else's just don't have it. So um, I think if we can set some sort of standards and priorities as a distro to say, here's what we expect the normal setup to look like, then that's going to actually have follow-on effects where people you know legitimately do have needs for logs. Go ahead, but. Um, but we want to make sure that the that the that the assumption is is Go back to less. The Sorry. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say on this slide was that, uh, like we have been in so many other situations, Debian's in a very unique position in in the fact that we're between the upstreams and the users, um, and we have so much in our archive uh, to sit down as a group and collectively uh, try and come up with some reasonable ideas here and uh, and help to drive this upstream and. Uh, 
and write some, some guidelines that apply both to Debian packages in the archive, but also our recommendations for upstreams to say, hey, you know, this is what we're adopting in Debian, and we really think it would be a good idea if, if uh, you did it as well. So concretely, what are some things that, um, that are issues, right? So one of these things is about the length that you keep the data, right? Maybe you, want to, maybe you decide you want to keep all the data that we've been keeping, but maybe you don't need to keep it as long as we've been keeping it. And our defaults govern what probably a, a very large set of systems that are out there do. And so we actually keep four weeks worth of logs by default in the regular log rotate package with some exceptions. Um, and I think it's worth noting, so we've broken a couple of them out here. Um, syslog we keep a week of and we rotate it daily. The um, dpackage logs keep, are kept for, um, for 12 months and Apache we keep 52 weeks of logs. So there's a full year's worth of tantalizing data that's just lying around on the disk that if someone comes to you and tries to get it away from you, whether it's by subpoena um, or by hackery, um, you've just given them that data. Won't this change a lot in Jesse? Is this too loud? Won't this change a lot in Jesse because of uh, Journal D? So uh, I do expect there to be some changes in Jesse, but I don't believe that Journal D is going to change our logging policies. It, it may provide us with an easier way to adjust logging policies centrally, which might be very nice, but I don't think that the defaults are going to change unless we decide to change them. Yeah, so I'm part of the Debian uh, system D team. And the current, we, we I by chance just discussed this yesterday. And because we discovered that the, the current settings, they are only based on on size of logs rather than um, rather than am, amount of time. So it's quite likely that we will change that to be, to match the current settings. And if people have opinions about what, if the current settings should be changed, then it would be a good time to talk about that now. Okay, I think I think probably we want. Well, I'm speaking for myself. I would love to see the settings reflect both the size and the time, right? So whichever comes first, kind of a thing, right? I mean, if it's um, so, yeah. So great. Thanks for being here. Also, it's good to have. So. Um, there, we can also, so fixing things at the infrastructural level, like at the logging daemon, is, is one of the things that we would really like to be able to do. Um, I don't know why I don't have, so I do actually have journal D here, but it's been stuck in the, in, sorry, it's a slide fail here. This is supposed to be a separate bullet. Um, so, um, so there are specific applications that we can modify um, to log things differently. Um, and then there's also the, this idea of doing it at the logging, like the overarching logging daemon, like approaching the roles separately, right? Do you fix it at the service? Do you fix it at the centralized logging? And I think we're going to need to probably fix in both and address the questions in both. And uh, the, the fixes you see on this slide are thanks to a few people in this room that have been working for years to get these things fixed and in upstream. For a long time they were carried as patches in Debian, but uh, most of these things are upstream now, which is really nice. And we can do more. Yeah. For the Debian.org host, for example, we don't lock the IPs anymore. And for De Debian.org, we don't log IPs. Yeah. Woohoo! Thank you. That's great to hear. Is that just the the web you're talking about, Sobel? Are you, is it? So yeah, is that? Noble just said we're, we're just removing them, at, removing the IP addresses from the web server logs and replacing them with zero zero zero. Is this Apache you're talking about? So are you doing that with the log format directive in Apache? Mm -hmm. So. That's all, but I would need to pick up. Yeah. Okay. I sh I'll, I'd like to talk to you about that because it. You will still log uh, IP addresses in your error logs that way. That's why this uh, lib Apache 2 mod remove IP will remove things before they get to the logging layer. So, so, um, so there's also, I think we can think about proposals that would affect Debian as a whole, um, and I think it's worth trying to come to you know some 
some attempt about like establishing the norms, and I know I've said establish norms a bunch of times. Establishing norms within Debian, I think, will help to establish norms that are outside of Debian as well. Um, and I, you know, like any other subject that has trade-offs, these are not going to be without their contention. But I think it's worth trying to have the discussion and figure out what we want to do. So. I think it would be really nice if, De if we could say somehow that Debian is private by default. And those words are, well, default's pretty obvious, but private is not. And it's going to be going to take some wrangling to figure out what the details are. Um, but packages could default to minimizing logging. And we can encourage packages to make it easy for a system administrator to temporarily disable the data minimization for debugging situations. And if a package can't do that easily, like if it's a lot of work to go from a standard data minimized approach to you know, turn up the noise, let me see what's going on in, you know, in, like, let me get a record in detail, then people are not going to want to have, they're going to want to go ahead and just have the standard be, like, leave the noise in and deal with having large logs. I'm curious, uh, a lot of the things that I wind up debugging are transient failures and maybe difficult to reproduce. And so in those cases, it's hard for me to actually go back and debug things if I don't have the information recorded in advance. Uh, is there an answer to that, or is it just that that is one of the costs of uh, having more private logging? Phil might have an answer. Is, it, is this in response? But how often are those actually useful? The logs that we are by default logging are often just not what you're looking for. So the log suddenly stops and you don't see why. So I'm not sure if there's in general in the default setting enough logging for you to debug anyway, so that might not make much of a difference here. Chris has a So one of the things that's standard for me to get as a question is, uh, what happened to my email? Like, did it go through, for instance? And I'm wondering, and the logs really are useful to figure out whether the mail went through or not. So I'm wondering, A, how, how to anonymize it so that I can still solve the problem for the user, and B, how long to keep the logs for? I can tell you a little more about what RiseUp does in this case. So for our postfix logs, we anonymize the IPs, but we leave in um, the usernames and, and the email addresses, the to and from, and that sort of thing, and we can track things down. The only time we ever we find that we ever need IPs is if someone's trying to denial service us or something like that, uh, but that's pretty rare. Um, but we also rotate logs pretty aggressively, and we only at any given time have maybe 12 to 24 hours of logs available, and sometimes we'll someone will file a help ticket and say, hey, you know, I'm having this problem. Um, and the, the cost in that situation is if the problem occurred more than a day ago, we have to say, sorry, we don't have logs that far back. Uh, you know, if it happens again, file a help ticket right away, and we can jump on it before the logs have disappeared. Um, but or, or you could say, try to, re you know, resend the, the same message that you thought didn't go through or get your, you know, you can encourage people to say, like, trigger the thing now and we'll look at it as it, as it happens. But that's the cost-benefit balance that we've chosen. Um, and I'm not advocating that balance for Debian. We're just advocating less than 52 weeks worth of logs or something like that, you know. Um, is there another? Uh, for email addresses, another option is to actually hash them in your logs so that you can, if somebody goes, my email address is foo at bar com. you can look that up, but it's kind of hard to actually just look up what, what has passed through. And that, that also, yeah, that, that minimizes the collateral damage somewhat. I mean, you can reverse hashes with enough, enough time, but. Yeah, that only works for incoming mail because, excuse me, if, if you have outgoing mail, you have a list in a, in a database of the users. You can just build a rainbow table of all the users in the database. So um, having done this 
uh, done a little, you know, central system administration for a university, one of the places where we tended to use a lot of this data was um, because we had a mandate to try to protect our users from attacks, in particular from phishing. And so one of the places where we used IP addresses in the logs a lot was to correlate um, access to different services from a particular IP range where we thought that someone who either had successfully phished accounts or had compromised accounts was coming from. So we used them a lot for security. Um, so giving that up is a hard sell is one of those justified <laughs> log reasons. I think there's a lot of power in having logs degrade over time instead of trying to do, because I think get, stripping out data is great if you can do it right up front um, and don't have those kind of needs. But if you do have those kind of needs, um, <laughs> One of the things you can do is um, you have all the IP addresses in the logs at first, and then after some period of time that's relatively short, maybe a day, maybe a week, you hash all the identifiable information. So now you can still get correlations if you need to track down something that's beyond that period of time, but you can't, but it's harder to pull the actual data back out of the logs directly. And then maybe after some longer period of time, like a month, you strip all the hashes out. So now you still have the, the logs that you need to do statistical analysis of like what services are being used, but you no longer have identifiable information, and then after some longer period of time, you actually throw the logs away completely. And if there were tools in Debian that did that sort of progressive deterioration of the logs automatically, I think a lot of people would turn them on, and you would get a lot of privacy almost for free. I was hoping that you were describing something that you guys were doing. No. Oh, man. <laughs> I have two comments to that. One uh, thing that, we, that Daniel and I talked about when we were preparing the slides was uh, kind of the webalizer case, because that's one thing that people like is being able to run analysis on their web logs. And uh, my understanding is that webalizer and some of these analyzers uh, now go through the logs, harvest the metadata, and put it into their own data storage. And so as long as your webalizer is sucking that data in and already doing that minimization, it's okay if we rotate the logs more often than, than 52 weeks a year. So a couple of other proposals of things that might be useful within Debian um, is an idea that maybe we can separate out what logs need to be persistent and what ones don't. Maybe make it easy for a system administrator to identify those things. That can help with some of the performance issues as well, but we can basically put all of the logs that don't need to be persistent, but just need to stick around, say, while the machine is up in a tempfs. And if we have mechanisms that are easily available to put that data um, in non-volatile storage, then you know, as soon as there's a machine reboot, uh, the data is gone. Um, so, and I also think there's, there's this idea that we could ask the user once, the assistant administrator once, you know what is your preferred logging level as a debconf question and then that that provides a hook for multiple packages to go in and say okay you know they think that you know a week's worth of logs is all they're going to need for all, for services that they haven't explicitly overridden so if that kind of question if that information were available centrally then other packages could pull from it and make appropriate decisions based on it It seems like uh, centralizing more of this logging policy into fewer controls would be quite useful. Uh, to that end, I wonder if we might want to have explicit Debian policy saying, if you're packaging software that can either log to syslog or to its own dedicated log, always default to syslog and the sysadmin can configure a separate log if they want. That's not in policy right now to the best of my knowledge. Perhaps it should be. Ditto for journal D. I think we deliberately avoided using the word policy in our slides. <laughs> but I think our hope is that we get there at some point, but we need to lay the foundation first. Okay. Um, so there's also some countries have data retention laws, or maybe they have some unclear status right now. But. Um, yeah, having having also maybe uh, pulling data from, you know, going to lawyers and asking them, okay, what should be Debian defaults for France? And so I can say, okay, France. And then I'm logging what is only strictly, you know, required by law to comply. That would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, also, one thing that we do on the server that I administer is that after two, we, so log rotate, log rotate has an option that is called, uh, well, you can call an, an arbitrary command as the compression step, and we use GPG. 
and so the logs are stored encrypted and so you can't just you know go into the server and grab a lot of historical data without requiring a key that is not anywhere on the server interesting that's it that's so it. maybe they should like get more integrated on something yeah i like that approach <laughs> so um, another thing that we noticed was that um, Debian builds all of its packages with the debug flags turned on um, and then strips the symbols out as part of the build process. And it's entirely possible that your upstreams might interpret the debug flag as meaning, oh yeah, I'm doing a debug build, therefore I'm going to be more verbose. So I, it would not surprise me, I don't have a specific instance of this, but if there's software in the archive that in Debian is actually more verbose by default, then when people build it themselves, um, just because we have the debug flag turned on during the build. So if you have a package that's producing logs, it might be worth looking around in that package's source code to see whether something like that is, is in play. Um, so I think it would be nice to have sort of like a framing document that describes sort of what we're trying to do. Um, and it smells a little bit like the DFSG to me, um, and I'm not proposing this to be on a par with the DFSG, but the idea that you know there are, there are things that we are looking for in in software that produces trail you know trails of activity, um, and so these are just some sort of um, you know this is a, a, a document that's going to be sort of at a very high level, not saying you have to do these specific things, but say hey these are the goals that we think that packages should do when they've got data of. Uh, um, of users, so I'll just read them out for folks, right? To acknowledge that the data that the data they produce could be sensitive, um, and that some data is especially sensitive. And if you can identify that, uh, and you don't need it in the logs, strip that especially sensitive data. Um, I think most packages are pretty good about, for instance, stripping passwords out of the logs that they produce. Um, but maybe we need to think about more things than just passwords as sensitive. So I, I don't know, Taggart. Uh, I think Colin has a. The other thing to be careful in, in light of stripping passwords is uh, something that uh, I think OpenSSH does this, uh, various other packages do it. If you're <laughs> pre-authentication, be careful about logging usernames. Uh, be careful about logging usernames from failed logins because it sometimes happens that people type Put in the, the wrong way around. In the, in the password field and vice versa, yeah. <laughs> Um, so and, you know, if we could if we could have a, a set of of these things, so that, um, minimize what you keep, minimize how long you keep it, make it easy for logging to become more verbose for people who need it, and for instances when it's needed. And it might also be nice if there are ways. I don't know of anything that does this right now, but to be able to say to a tool, increase your logging to you know for for diagnostics. And while I'm telling you to do this, I'm also telling you that in 10 more minutes, I want you to decrease your logging. Um, so that you could say, I want to capture this stuff, but I don't have to worry about getting distracted in the middle of whatever I was doing, and then I come back two weeks later and find that my logs are full, and I've got a lot of data that I didn't want to actually have. Um, so if you're a DD and you maintain a package and the package produces logs, um, think about this compile time debug uh, question. Uh, if you find an instance of it, I'd be happy to hear about it, see if we can dig it up. I have a I have a crazy suggestion. Um, maybe we should have a version of log rotate that knows how to strip stuff when it rotates the log. And then you would be able to say, well, I'll keep the IP address or the email address or whatever it is for the first few days. So, I mean, what Lunar was suggesting was just that the, that the rotate command runs an arbitrary compression filter. And you could have it be GPG or you could be, have it be said. So sounds like that's something that people could do. Also, can we move the logs from one place to another? I mean, another thing that occurs to me is maybe I want the full information in my Tumpfus and some redacted version on disk. Yeah. A couple more hands. I was just going to say, if you store it first disk and then uh, later remove it, then a backup could pick it up. The data are going to be out there. Yeah. Um, so I th I'm totally okay with, or I think the idea is good of being able to write it to TempFS if you want to, and that should not be the default, as you advocate. And also just to point out, even if you're careful about your backups, nowadays there's copy and write file systems, so 
to my knowledge, there is no copy and write file system in mainline kernel that has the ability to to retroactively strip out data. So I don't I don't know of a way to solve that. But well, it depends on what what um, if you're assuming that someone is coming after your data, right? There there are situations where someone comes to you and says, "Give us your data." And you can turn around and say, well, I don't have the data um, because I've deleted the file. And while it may be true that it resides in some patterns on my hard drive, you know, I'm not about to tear down my hard drive and, and rip that stuff out. And then there may be a situation where you, there's just simply someone who's, like, if you're being hacked, they may not have the technical capacity to do that. So deleting is better than not deleting, but I agree with you, there's still data left. To some degree, you can also fix that by using secure arrays. If the file system does the secure erase, right? Uh, that's I, no. That's actually doesn't actually require file system support. Um, okay, I'd like to hear about that more. But there's a couple hands. Sorry. No. So what secure erase does is it's a SCSI ATA level command where it will uh, you'll discard any unused blocks in the file system, and any file system actually knows it will have to keep track of what blocks are used or not. So it's the file system that needs to make the decision. No, it's it's the block. Well, anyway. the file system knows what blocks are in use, not yes. But right, so we should be looking at the tu at tuning at at that level as well in terms of making sure that the data is actually gone. Yes. Yeah. There's also at least for Butterfs you have the no cow option. So you could have a, a, a sub-volume that you write all your logs to that doesn't do copy on write. Okay. So with the caveat that I'm not a lawyer, what we were told at, uh, by legal counsel at Stanford when we were dealing with uh, cases of subpoenaed logs is that um, basically the way this works is that um, when you're through with a subpoena for logs, you and this is mostly for civil, so criminal is a different story, but for, for, for civil subpoenas, um, basically the person who's subpoenaing the logs has to pay the cost, um, and if it's not, you know, sort of there's a, like a customary cost that uh, for reasonable, reasonably accessible data. If so, in the case of things like where it might be residing in blocks in the file system that you have to do data recovery in order to get at it, in that kind of a situation, you basically get to hand a bill to the opposing counsel who's trying to subpoena the logs for not only the cost of doing the entire data recovery service, but all the cost of downtime for your service while you pull the hard drives out and so on and so forth. And basically, you just get to start adding zeros. So the opinion of legal counsel is essentially that as long as it's hard enough that they can just start adding arbitrary zeros onto the end, pretty much people just go away. Uh, so log rotate also has a shred, a shred option now, uh, since Wheezy, I guess, and we can turn it by default. I don't know. So someone just said only on some file systems. We, just so folks know, we have um, we have I think seven minutes left. Um, instead of trying to sanitize logs after the fact, after storing them in Boston storage, what I've found to easier to do, and been doing that for maybe ten years, is to actually log twice. Some the uh, the logs that I um, want to have a non-redacted version of, I log the non-redacted version to tempfs for a small amount of time, and I also log the same messages to Boston storage, but redacted. So you don't have to find clever ways to remove data that you've already written to disk and find ways to avoid that this data can be recovered later, which is actually a hard problem. That sounds similar to what Ross was proposing, but maybe a more feasible way of getting to, getting to that point. Just on the uh, question of what to do if you're getting civil subpoenas, I can't speak for every state. I can speak for the state of Washington and for the federal system. Most attorneys involved in high-level civil litigation right now are engaging 
in massive amounts of e-discovery. They're very sophisticated in doing it. They'll usually send their consultants out to your device and they'll say, you leave your hard drive where it is, they'll just dump it all out. And when you produce it according to subpoena, you're supposed to produce it in its native format as you store it. So the bills will actually not be an impediment. Um, it's a good thought, but actually they're, they're ahead of the curve right now and uh, they're accessing this data left to right and center. All the more reason to not have it. One more hand up here. Um, I'm quite interested in by this idea of um, tidying the logs up after you've written them to persistent storage, um, which, if you're going to be subpoenaed six weeks later, is useful. But if I uh, left my laptop on a train, for example, um, and I'm rotating my logs on a daily basis. Today's logs are right there for you to read. Um, and along the same vein, at least in the UK, I can't speak for anywhere else, um, if a warrant is issued to acquire data from you on a criminal basis rather than a civil basis, um, you, you don't get... You, you, somebody doesn't turn up and say, give me your logs, please. They turn up and say, sit where you are, I am taking your equipment. And you, at that point, you have no opportunity to do any kind of scrubbing. Right. Um, so you're much better off not having written them in that form in the first place. And I don't think we should forget that we're not necessarily talking about civil subpoenas. There are all sorts of other ways in which somebody might try and get hold of something from you. So I just have one very small point. Um, now, uh, we've been talking a bit about the arguments that one might have with, with one's managers, um, if one's a sysadmin, about data minimization. Um, the situation in the US is pretty bad, but in the European <coughs> Union, um, there's the European Union Data Protection Directives, which legally mandate that you should not keep unnecessary data. Um, and you know, I won't go into the, the whole detail of that, but... Um, one way to look at some of this is to say, well, we should make it easier for people who are running our systems to comply with European law, as, as well as obviously you know, going beyond that and doing what we think is right. I think that's a reasonable way to approach it. Perhaps you could set the defaults based on what language you select at the beginning. So, like, if you selected English, we could say, "Well, you're probably Which living English? in the U.S." <laughs> you're right. Yeah. Amer <laughs> if you selected American English, then you know we could say, "Well, you're in the U.S." Or if you, yeah, yeah, I think I think asking it as an explicit, separate question. Well, right. No, I'm I'm saying like. We could we could set the we could ask it as a separate question, but set the default based on your based language, on a, based on a guess from your language. Yeah, exactly. I think that I think that has a lot of potential for confusion, especially because I know that there are people who run their systems in American English simply because that is the most widely, um, yeah, or C. Yeah, what does C have to say about the law? <laughs> So, so I also think as a project we don't want to get in the habit of ourselves trying to interpret the laws of all these different countries and figuring that out. We are, we are not the well, there, police or the government. But there may, be, there may be someone who wants to do the thankless job that's like TZ data, right? Which is every time somebody changes a time zone, you know, so yeah. we have a way of formalizing something. But I, I suspect that the laws around data logging is much more complicated than the laws around daylight savings time. And please, 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 don't be confused into the belief that existing geopolitical boundaries mean anything with respect to data protection, data privacy, who's going to mine what. So we've got, uh, um, Tiger and I set up a, a, a very uh, rudimentary sketch of a wiki page, um, which is just wiki.debian.org slash logging. Um, and we want to start filling that in, and we want to start trying to come up with a um, uh, sort of, you know, a set of guidelines that we think make sense for tools that are in Debian. Um, I don't know if folks are interested in um, in setting up a mailing list as well to discuss this and sort of bat around ideas, or if we want just want to ch like change things through the wiki and then use existing mailing lists for discussion where it comes up. Um, 
I just heard a whisper of Debbie and Devel over there. Um, <laughs> that's quite the fire hose to read. Um, if you want to filter it through for questions just about what, lo what logging guidelines should be. Um, if we decide to set up a mailing list, if enough people come up to me and say, yes, this should be a separate mailing list, um, we'll put the mailing list on that wiki page. Um, but I invite you to go to the wiki page and, and try to add um, thoughts and observations and concerns that you have. Um, and maybe we should probably establish some user tags uh, within debugs that indicate so that we can find uh, where these policies um, or these guidelines, sorry, I wasn't supposed to use the P word, um, where these guidelines are, are not being met or where we think they're not being met as a chance to sort of come to you know, the usual rough consensus within the project. There's a... Um, later in the week, there's an upstream guide buff. So if you guys could come to that and we could discuss uh, how we can advise our upstreams about the defaults for logging, that'd be great. Um, the other thing is, earlier in the week we were discussing a possibility of a Debian free services guidelines document. Um, maybe we could add that this sort of stuff to that document as well. Yeah, I think that would be good. Just to say, our wiki has a subscribe option, so you can subscribe to that page and you will know when there is a change. Do that. Good call. All right, so I think we're out of time. Uh, thanks, folks, for coming and talking about it. And uh, I look forward to making Debian uh, more respectful of our users' privacy and uh, more protective for our users.